just amazing. Do you have a question? Okay. Cool. You look really great. It's scary. Great. You remember me from yesterday. Yeah, of course I do. Yeah, you look great, man. So my question to you is... Bring the, bring the mic up a little bit. I don't know how. Well, you know what? Just pick it up like you're Elvis. Just pick the mic stand right up. Yeah, just, yeah there we go. Why not? All right. My question to you is... Yes. In your character or your own personal opinion, yes. what do you think is the true ending to Far Cry 5? Ooh. There's the passive ascending where the rookie listens to you and walks away. Uh -huh. There's option... Hold on one second. Anyone that hasn't gone to the end of the game yet... Let's have an earmuffs moment or something like that, because I... Spoiler alert, all over the place here. Um, whisper, let's talk about life. Um, right. So what do I think the... The true ending to Far Cry 5 is. Well, I think... Well, I think one of the challenging things about the game is that the ending is ambiguous, and it doesn't really end. And I think that it was a pretty daring, creative choice by Dan Hay, who's the, the creative director for the Far Cry franchise, um, to make the ending realistic in the way that often life isn't satisfying. Like it doesn't end in a neat little bow. And I think it leaves more questions than answers, which is kind of interesting. For me, I was right. I mean, I gotta be right somewhere. God knows when I'm asking my kids to clean their room, they do not have the same respect for me that the cult leaders. I mean, that's why I like the game so much, is everyone had to listen to me. It was scripted. I think the reason why you say that is because in all three of the endings, you are not uh, technically wrong. No. You are proven right. Yeah, I mean, that's the alarming thing, is that you have someone who's ostensibly you think might be um, having auto yeah, auditory hallucinations and, and is not well, but yet, um, his his vision is validated. Um, again, I hate to spoil anything for anybody. Let, do you have any other questions that are less spoiler oriented? All right. Um, something away from the game. Yes. Okay. So the franchise itself has become very popular. Yes. So do you think they'll give it the same treatment as they did with Assassin's Creed and give it its own movie or TV series? Well, that's interesting. So we shot this little companion film. Uh, for Amazon called Inside Eden's Gate. That's a short film. A short film. Um, I, I think that that's a logical extension for Ubisoft as a company because they have these amazing franchises. There's great built-in storytelling opportunities. Um, there's so many, uh, in the same way, and I don't want to compare it to a Marvel, but in the same way the Marvel has their universe and they had all this material that you could generate stories from that it wouldn't surprise me if Ubisoft got into the television or film business. And I know they've partnered up with the Assassin's Creed movies, but that wasn't really done very by well. Ubisoft. Well, I wasn't going to say very well, um, <laughs> but it, it wasn't really done by them. I, I could see a Far Cry series, and I think it would be an interesting anthology series where you could take each of the titles and sort of do an eight episode series based on them. Um, I don't know, I don't know at what stage of development there is, but I, I've heard rumblings that that's something they might want to try. Be, would it be considered live action, or would it be like one of those animated rated R shows they'd have hmm. on Adult Swim? I don't know. Um, I would assume that they would get into the live action, although I've seen someone, I saw someone do this treatment for a, like a short film based on using the cinematics from Grand Theft Auto or something. They made a movie with the, like computer animation. It was really quite interesting. I don't know, it's a brand new world. There's Great storytellers are going to find a way to tell their stories, and and I think there's a real opportunity there. But I don't know how it will shape up. They don't. They don't really ask me that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Step right up. Okay. So we met yesterday, and I actually showed you a photo. And I wanted to ask your opinion. Yes. Who really did it? Who really made the watering mac and cheese? Who made it? Yes. <laughs> what is your John or Jacob? Or Faith. Yeah, or Faith. Um, I can only guess. Jacob. I can only Jacob. Wasn't paying attention, Jacob. Um, making the watery Jacob.
back to the Chiefs. So I don't have a definitive Jacob answer, but my guess, if I was going to point an accusing finger at anybody, Jacob, uh, it would be John. Yeah, you stole his mind, so I could try to come. Yeah. You did. You are psychic. I like it. Uh, so I, I mean, there's such fun little details in the game. Like it's obviously it's a, it's it's a serious subject matter, and it's complicated characters, and we live in a complicated world. But those little details, uh, those fun little I don't know whimsical moments, it's kind of make it lovely. It's like a grace note, right? Like you're having a crappy day and something fun and unexpected happens and that's it. Unless you really are crazy with mac and cheese and the watery mac and cheese is the worst thing that happens in the game, which is possible for some mac and cheese lovers. Like, you know, but I don't know who did it. Who do you want to blame? You think I did it? No. I'm a, I make killer lunches, <laughs> literally. No, I just imagine it's just like Joseph's off doing something else, and then John and Jacob are just looking at each other, just like, what do we want to do? We were told to go to get more people for the cult. What do we want to do? Yeah. John's just like, let's make mac and cheese. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Jacob just doesn't know what to do. And then like, I sat there eating it, like, really unhappily, like... Trying to make your brother happy. <laughs> really? Good job, fellas. You're not invited to karaoke on Friday night. Because that's the other thing at Eden's Gate. We had an amazing karaoke Friday. It was, I would just start bringing out the Madonna and uh, Papa Don't Preach. I'm in trouble deep. Yeah. Um, so I can't, I mean, it's a good question. It's a fun question. I can't answer it. And you guys, I'm going to be honest. Uh, you guys probably know more about the game than I do. I knew my character. I'm a terrible video game player. During the promotion for the game, they flew me out and try to play with influencers and stuff, and I couldn't get out of the first scene. You know when you're walking me to the helicopter? But if you don't go the right speed, you, like that was it. Like that was, that was my threshold for confidence. I could barely get to the helicopter. So there's so much of the game I have no idea what happened because I have no idea what happens. I know what I did. They purposely put you at a distance where you either have to run, but they don't give you that option immediately. So you're always just barely close enough to yeah. not get pulled away from Joseph and taken down. So it's just like, you have to like constantly hit the L button with I know. control, or you're not gonna make it. And it's just like, well, okay then. But, but that bar was still set pretty low for me. <laughs> and there was like, competent people around me going, no, great, just point that way. Like, the, and then like, they'd get frustrated and they'd like, just take it out of my hand, take the controller away, and I'd be like, oh, come on now. <laughs> anyway, thank you for the question. Oh, hello, mirror. Hello, Father. Wait a minute. <laughs> All over. In your pocket. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. I'm just trying to. Oh. <laughs> At one time in my life, there would have been like diapers in here, a bottle. It was like I was like one of those, uh, I was like a pack rat. I'm like, okay, now I feel like I can answer the question truthfully. <laughs> or not. Yes, Father? <laughs> if you had to pick one place to live, would it be Hope County or Gilead? Ooh. Dark questions. <laughs> um, well, like Montana is beautiful. I'm going to say Hope County. Gilead is, is relentlessly great. I mean, beautiful and ominous. Yeah, Hope County. Hope County was. Hope County is beautiful. I shot, it was interesting because, um, I'll share a little Greg's an idiot moment with you all. When we did, uh, when we shot Inside Eden's Gate, we shot it in Montana, the little companion film that was on Amazon and is now on, on YouTube and other platforms. So we were making the game at the time, Far Cry 5, and then they were doing this companion film. So I flew out to Montana um, to, to, do the, to do the little movie. And uh, when I landed, there was a driver waiting for me. And I walked out of the building, and it smelled amazing. Like it was spectacular, a little bit of cedar in the air. And I'm like, oh my God, this is God's country out here. And I said to the driver, I said, oh my, it smells amazing. And he said, that's because our state's on fire. <laughs> like I, I just wasn't aware, I mean, the whole Montana was on fire at the time. As you guys are obviously well aware, living in California, like it was forest fire season. 
but it smelled amazing. And so we, uh, I was, you know, while we were shooting, and, and they sent me, I'm not giving any spoilers, but they sent me, uh, as we were shooting the film, uh, Drew Holmes, who's the head writer for the game, sent me the, the eulogies, the final for each of the siblings, and then in the final one. And um, I was in between setups for the, the film, I was learning the, these monologues, and I would look up, and there was just like a, you could see a ridge of fire all the way around us in the mountains, and the the sun was practically blacked out by the smoke. And it was such a visceral experience learning these sort of end of the world uh, monologues and the grief and the sadness and loss and just being surrounded by that. It was a really powerful moment. A lot of times as an artist you have to, you're really digging to try, sort of try to find the truth of a moment. Uh, and that was right in my face. And, uh, and even though it was on fire, it was still a very beautiful place to be. So Montana, thank you. How are you doing? Good. Uh, I'm trying to spoiler warning. But spoiler warning. <laughs> if you guys just want to sing "Amazing Grace," it'll drown it out a little bit. It'll be good. Uh, but when we like killed all the members, John, Jacob. Yes, I know what you did to my family. Uh, but that ending. Scene Yeah. I was like amazed, just like, wow, how, like, what made you that sad, or what you well, were going through the process? Um, so, for each of the siblings, I have, like, I have kids who I love a great deal, obviously. And, uh, and as an actor, I, uh, a lot of times will, uh, I'll play with, Lost with them specifically. And it's very upsetting for me, needless to say. So I was going through those um, those things, and there was so there was a, a sadness to it. And then we were getting ready for that final bit, and um, it was interesting because we did it once, and Dan Hay, uh, who was again the creative director for the whole Far Cry franchise, was there. He's an unbelievable artist, and Drew Holmes, the lead writer, was there. And we did it a couple of times, and it was in a good place, but it just was, um, it was missing uh, the complete collapse. And there is something that I'm not gonna tell you, but there is something in my own life that is, uh, that came up, and they could feel it in the room. It was pretty amazing. We, in the, yeah, where we do the game, a studio in Toronto, there's a train that goes by every once in a while, and, and it wrecks the tape, like, inevitably. So the train hadn't come by in a while, and Dan and uh, Drew, I was sort of pacing around in the bomb as I, as I do, and, and this thing just dropped in, and, and they could feel it, like in this, it's a big one, they could feel it come off me, and they just yelled to the camera, like, go, and I sat down, and we did it, and obviously all of that stuff happened, and I went to a, the darkest place I have it. But it felt very, it felt cathartic, it felt right. And then as soon as we finished, it was dead silence. And then the train went by. And then Dan turned to the, the, the team that does the rendering and they said, I want, and he said, I want it all in the game. I want every bit of snot. I want every flicker of his eye. I want it all in the game. Don't try to make it pretty. That was it. And then we, and that was the last thing I shot for the game. That was the last, the final bit that we put down. Um, so it was, uh, I, I work personally, that's as an actor, that's all I know how to do. So I deal with the loss of my kids, I deal with the loss of um, things that are uh, most dear to me and I think it makes the work dangerous because we can, we can feel that in each other, something real. Thank you for that question. Hello. Hey. How are you today? Nice to see you Great again. Great costume, man. Thank you guys look, I just want to say, I've not done a lot of these conventions, we're going to get to your question, but I've only been to a few conventions. I am so blown away and dazzled by the artistry of the costumes, by the passion you guys have for the shows and the games and the characters that you like 
And the thing that I find most inspiring is that everybody clearly has the things that they love most, the games, the whatever. And you are committed to that and fiercely protective and loyal to that, but yet you're so curious and accepting of what everybody else is interested in. And it really is the, the perfect balance of having the things that you like best, but being so accommodating and, and generous of spirit with everyone around you. It really is quite a beautiful um, dynamic, a beautiful community you guys have created. And, and uh, it's extraordinary. And it's really lovely to see. I know you have a question. I'm sorry. I just like go off. It's okay. It's okay. Um, I got to say, um, great to be in front of you again. Um, my question. Oh. There's one out. Oh. It's on, yeah. Um, my question is is that, um, and, this, and I don't know if this is going to be any spoilers or not, but. Um, after the end, sure. when you're uh, driving to uh, Dutch's bunker, um, yeah. what um, like what made your character like you know forgave the deputy after you know he took out all of your family and your character like he's like you know, uh, I'm gonna spare you. I think this thing is going out. It comes off and on, but I'm hearing you. There, it's on. Bas uh, basically, um, what, made your, what made your character um, forgive, forgive, forgive the, uh, the deputy? Well, uh, sorry, spoilers all over the place here. Um, I don't, uh, I was alone, you know, and I lost everything, and you've taken everything from me. And we're all we have. And there was something malevolent and raw about that moment for me and just sitting there staring at the player when we were shooting that. And it was, um, you know how love can punish? I was filled with a punishing love at that moment. Love shouldn't punish, but love can punish. And it was filled with that. So I'm not sure if it was forgiveness in so or more that you're all I have and I'm gonna make a family of you, and only you. It's pretty dark and gay, actually. I think that I think that Joseph probably needs counseling. I think that I think that maybe his relationship skills aren't the strongest. I think maybe the relationship got a little codependent with the deputy there. Uh, I think we need counseling. I think that that should be a DLC. It should just be a counseling session for the deputy <laughs> and the player, and just just talk it out. Like let's just figure it out. Let's make let's figure out how we're gonna make this work. Seeing as how we're gonna spend like, what's that? Huh? It'll be bot the therapist. <laughs> oh yeah, that'd be amazing. Oh my God, could you imagine that gong show? <laughs> that looks more right <laughs> Oh, mental health of Michael Mando, really now. He's spectacular. Um, so yeah, I, that's a really interesting question, and I think to the yeah, yeah there's a level of um, where we yeah, I've been stripped of, of everything, and we're starting again from this broken place. Hey Sue. Hey. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you? Good. You you look amazingly like Superman should look. Oh, thank you. I like this uh, that swirl. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Ron over in the exhibitor hall, he did that for me. Yeah, it's really good. It looked great. Okay. So my question is, as an actor, how does working in a motion capture studio compare to working on an actual, in terms of being able to get into the headspace of a character? Um, that's a good question. And it was, a, it, it was my first and only experience in video game world. I think that I was very fortunate because the team at Ubisoft was incredibly sensitive to that process and um, it took a minute it took a minute to get used to the, that contraption they put on my head with the camera in my face and the lights and there are some restrictions just how close you can get head to head um, but but it was really the writing was so incredible and I felt such a connection 
for that character. Like right from the first monologue that I ever read, the, first, the character's first lines are, I was, uh, we were 23 and we were pregnant with our first child. Stole the microphone, is that right? Yeah, that's it. Fixing it, maintenance. I don't wanna talk long enough until the microphone's fixed. Um, so I just, I got the, the collapse. <laughs> so, um, so everyone to the bunker. Um, it, it was, it, it, it struck a chord with me. I mean, I got my, my wife pregnant when I was that age and we were in theater school. I was 22, wasn't even 23. And I also was terrified of becoming a father and the responsibility. And I also felt like a nobody from nowhere with nothing. And I had this life that I was going to be responsible for. Um, I took it and made a healthier choice when my kid was born than Joseph did. But I, I, so I felt a real connection right, right from the first time that I read any of the writing. And then they were so gracious about writing specifically for me. They knew kind of how I felt. We spent a lot of time talking and having lunch and, and they got a sense of my rhythms and Drew really wrote for me. Um, it was kind of like doing a play because you don't have a lot of reality around you when you're doing a film. Like it's you're just, you're in the world. So you just have to live in that world. Uh, but I also was fortunate that some Actors when they do games that I'm, I'm blown away by, they have to like really interact with stuff that's not there. For me, it was mostly there was a, a guy named uh, Randy who was the player, and he had a camera on his face, and I played most of it to Randy or to Faith or to John or to Jacob. So I didn't. I was it was still mostly person to person connection. So as an actor, that wasn't that wasn't that different. Um, but I was amazed at how satisfying. Uh, creatively it was and also I was so grateful to the skill of the the artists and I call them renderers but they must have a more technical name the people that actually take the film and the motion capture and make it you know into the computer thing is that the technical term the computer thing it's rendering yeah the rendering yeah so re yeah the people that do the rendering like when you look at the filmed version of it which you know I got to see all of that stuff beside the way it was rendered it's it was incredible. As an actor, you're so protective of your performance because you know what you revealed of yourself. You just want it to be caught. I know that if a film catches it, um, I know that an audience will catch it in a play, but I didn't know how that would work out on a computer game. And it was incredible. So blessed. And, and I see like the, there's other games, The Last of Us, and that new Red Dead Redemption, all this stuff. It's the level of storytelling and character development in this world is a gift for actors because now there's a whole new uh, medium with incredible characters to play. So it's pretty great stuff. Thank you. <laughs> Officer, you, you coming to arrest me? Is this it? God won't let you take me. It's not you my jurisdiction. Right? It's not my jurisdiction. It's not? Okay, good. <laughs> then we can be friends. Next, next year I'll be the deputy. Oh, okay, good. So, like, because it's all based around this whole cult, like culture mm -hmm. and everything. Do you think it's possible in a hypothetical sense that what you have learned and what you have been through as doing doing the acting, mm -hmm. is it possible that you could, in a theoretical sense, start your own cult? Like, mm -hmm. as you. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, you know, I, 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 it's, I don't want to say it's funny. <laughs> um, I like people a lot. I uh, I think that the whole idea of a cult is and cult leaders is an interesting dynamic for me. No, I don't think I'm going to start a cult. Um, but I do enjoy I do enjoy having an impact in people's lives. Like and I've been blessed, really have been blessed with my my um, career path that I get a chance to talk to people and I get a chance to share a little bit about myself and of my life and. Share, I don't want to use wisdom, but I share some of the thoughts that I have, and hopefully they resonate. And I was also, you know, I got to do a TED Talk, which was amazing. So I think that this platform that I've been given is a real gift, and I try to use it positively. And I take that responsibility very seriously. Um, in the same way that I take the responsibility of being a father to my kids, seriously. I take being a husband, seriously. I take being a member of the community in my city, seriously. Um, I think that we need to give back. I think that we need to be generous with the best parts of ourselves. I think we need to live for ourselves, but then we should be 
generous with the best parts of ourselves so although i will not start a cult anytime soon but leave a card just in case because i'll reach out um but i i think that we i think that a cult is really just maybe um A, a mutated idea of a family, but I think the idea of family is very important. And I think we create families wherever we go, and I think that's important. And you know, one of the things that Father talks about is technology. And I think that technology is incredible. I think the power of the phone in our hands is an incredible tool. I also think it has the capacity to alienate us in a way that nothing else can. I think that we are given the illusion of connectivity sometimes through it and we lose connection with the people that are closest to us. The human aspect. Yeah, the human aspect. I mean, it really is, we've, uh, you know, it's important, it's important to be a citizen of the world and think globally, be connected globally, but it's also very important to be present in your life, to be present at the dinner table, um, to, to help people, to care about people, to touch people, to hug people, to love in a very, small and intimate ways, so, um, you know, that's something that matters a great deal to me, and something that I sort of like the opportunity to talk about, because I don't want to, it's like, I'm like, well, we don't have to get rid of technology, but I think we need to recognize that there are inherent dangers with it. Any great power needs great responsibility. What's the actual line? I'm sorry, I butchered it. With great, great power, power comes great responsibility. responsibility. There you go. Mm -hmm. Did it. I, was, I was in the ballpark. Like, I would probably still get, you know, fail for plagiarism in class because it's definitely not my line, but not close enough to be accurate. That's about where I live. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a simple question. I'll give you a simple answer. Do you think the shovel is overpowered? Do I think the... The shovel? The shovel? Yeah. The javelin. The javelin. Why can you toss at people and can flip people's skulls in half? Do I think it's what? Overpowered. Because you can shoot it at, you can throw yeah. it at people there. Oh, do, do I mean I think it's got more power than it should have? Yeah. yeah. I'm going to be honest, I didn't know there was a shovel in the game. <laughs> really? No, I, I didn't. Like, this is... I guarantee every player used it to destroy the, the entire cult. Really? Yeah. It's like a super shovel? Yeah, super shovel. Some, you know, hey. It's like a javelin meets a baseball bat. Yeah. Bonk. I... Okay, no, then it's just got the right amount of shovel power. I mean, why not? If you're going to take out a cult, a shovel seems like a, a good way to do it. And you've got to uh, dig down deep. Dig, dig in and, and javelining and walloping people with it. Yeah, I don't know. I, again, I, I, I played the character and I loved the character and I really love the world, but I don't know the nuance of the game because, as I explained, I suck at video games, like really suck. So unless we're talking about the first scene or any of the scenes that I was in, I have no clue. I know that Boomer's really cute and there's a bear. Yeah, cheeseburger's great. I know you can fish. Not even the radio talks? I mean, I, I the ones that are recorded? Yeah, the ones you talk over the game once they get a certain problem. Yeah, no, I know those because I said those. I don't know which ones are in the game though. I think a lot of them. You guys, this is a different, I have questions to ask you. What other weapons are in the game? For real, like, I'm not being, like what else? I, I assume you have a gun of some sort. The microwave. You have a microwave? It's a circular microwave that shoots out microwaves at people and they just get disintegrated. Yeah. Is it blood? At close it's range. It's a laser pistol. There's a laser pistol in Montana? Yeah. yeah. So we have laser pistols and we have overpowering shovels Circular microwaves. And you Can you make popcorn there. with it at all? What else? A shovel launcher. Oh, a shovel, shovel launcher. launcher. Yep. Yeah. And the, the, the animals can attack, right? Yeah. yeah. There's a gun that shoots shovels that are already overpowered. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's the homing missiles. <laughs> you know what? That's a, there's a lot I don't know. I have been, I've, I've come right, up to the limits of my uh, knowledge, and it's uh, it's wanting. Thank you for that. Sorry that I couldn't give you an answer. I think we got a great right answer. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, considering that we've had a lot of somber answers, I think I'll, I'll have a very, hopefully humorous oh. question. All right, so this, I'm gonna- This is as humorous as I can. You found this somber? 
I'm ready. I'm gonna get somber. Okay, yes, I'm ready. Okay, I'm ready. You're... shake it up, shake it up, shake it up. All right, I'm gonna make a situation here. You're in your church, you are preaching, and yep. then all of a sudden, vast pagan men in the jackal walk in. Vas offers to play a game of cards, men offers everybody a drink. Uh huh. And you all start conversing. Uh -huh. What goes down? That's such an open ended question. Um, I think we drink. I think we play cards. I for sure let Vas shave my head. Like I do like like a Mohawky version. Like maybe just like the Mohawk to the man bun and that's it. You look like, like Seamus. What's that? You look like Seamus, where it's like straight up and this very thin line of hair. Sure. Okay. Um, we would do. Uh, I have uh, play some trades, maybe. Uh, I think we'd probably end up in an argument. I think we'd like about rules, right? Like boss will want no rules. There's no rules to this game. We just throw it around. That. I don't know Pagan Min's character well enough to know. I know he wears a, a spiffy suit. A splendid colored suit. And then uh, it just ends with guns blazing and hair. Yeah, for sure we killed each other. The only one, this would be like, it would be a, a three person fortnight. It wouldn't last long. The storm would happen right there. But who would win? Yeah. Yeah. Because they're in his church and then they're That's like, right. when it gets too far. And I've got the shovel. I've got the super overpowering shovel. You can't beat the shovel. It's like paper, rock, shovel, and shovel wins over everything. Because it's the only game that has the throwing shovel. Yeah, that's right. So yes, we win. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Hey, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Good. So this is a bit of an odd question. So I'm an odd guy. Let's have at it. In Far Cry Five. Yep. Spoilers. I don't think it is, but um, there are a lot of fakes in Far Cry Five, like. Joseph goes through a lot of fakes. So I was asking, what do you think made a fake a fake? Okay. To choose who's a fake. I think that Joseph is, is broken in a pretty fundamental way and being a product of the orphanage system to be torn away from his brothers who really cared for him and protected him when he was a child and he was alone. I think there's a, a great there's something missing, clearly. Um, and I think that the maternal aspect of the feminine energy is missing and something that's essential for Joseph to have. Like there's a, there's, there's a, a, a sense of acceptance that faith has for him that is a, outside of the dynamics of even with Jacob and with John, I mean, we're, brothers and there's an order, but there's always a friction. There's always an ambition, yeah. right? Yeah. And with faith, and this is probably accurate, but horrible that it's not, she doesn't need to have a specific energy because she's something that I, there's something of an essence that I need as opposed to a person that I need. And so in that way, she was um, larger. It was almost like the Mother Earth energy, and it didn't have to be one person. It just had to be a person that filled that need that, that for me, right? Yeah. So it was. Um, that's why I always needed a faith. I always needed faith, and and when I would lose faith, I would find another faith. Thank you. You're welcome. I was really shoveling fast there. Speaking of an overpowered shovel. <laughs> Well, uh, again, it's, uh, I, I mean, I'm, I don't know how many of y'all have siblings, but there's something, there's something essential about blood and, and whether you like the person or love the person or hate the person, the common truth of your blood exists always. And, you know, those were Jacob and John were my protectors when I was a boy. And then they were taken from me and I was alone. And when a person's alone and afraid, they build protective shields.
shields around themselves and sometimes it's it's physical sometimes it's a mental construct you do whatever you can to protect yourself and then so there was a certainty of my ideas and and the voices i heard and the mission that i was on was absolute and john being loyal but john also being driven by an ego and john sometimes using um, using God's message for personal gain and for, you know, a little bit of the saddest in him. A little bit. And we all have pain and we exercise that pain in different ways. And for me, it felt like it wasn't in the service of, with John, sometimes it wasn't in the service of the greater good that I, that had been revealed to me. But it was for his good. So um, I needed to correct him. Sometimes John needs correcting. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, no kidding. You say it's a shitty macaroni maker, too. I mean, really. I, it's on the package. I mean, and on top, just add more butter and cream than is called for, and it's gonna be, it's gonna be good. It's like, we're like the, uh, that's, that's, that's domestic goddessing 101, like mac and cheese, the butt toast. I mean, I should have started John with toast, maybe, cereal, dry cereal first, then let him add a little bit of milk at a time, just to work his way up. I mean, it was like the fans. Like we start on mac and cheese, and then that's it's too much. He's reading a box, you know. He's like kicking cats and dogs that are wandering around, you know, glaring at people. I don't know. I shouldn't have trusted him with that. No more mac and cheese for John. Thank you for that question. <laughs> Sub Benjamin, Benjamin, right? You know, give me the double double deuces and the twirl again. Yeah, his finger earlier today, and then twirled, like fingers and twirled, like this. I'll show you. <laughs> Stuck it. Yeah. Um, do you have the collector edition of Father by your best man? Do I have the what? The little. The little you for the from the collector. Well, I, I, I don't have the statue um, next to my bed, but yesterday night, that like someone brought that little sort of handmade Funko thing, and that did sit on my bed bedside table last night because it seems kinder than the statue of me. Like the statue of me is super judgy, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, super judgy, just sitting there either like this or like this, and. Uh, and you wake up from a nightmare, and you wake into a nightmare. It's just not a, I'm not a great sleeper anyway. If there was a father nightlight when I was a kid, maybe. But like in the dark, that, with maybe a little shaft of moonlight on it. Dude. <laughs> Terrifying. Any other questions? Um, shoot, I forgot the line. Oh, no. Insert line from Handmaid's Tale. Oh. Yeah, Handmaid's Tale was another uh, one of my rom-coms that I, uh, light and charming fellas that I trot out from time to time. Not for real. Way with those characters. Obviously it says something about me. Like, <laughs> obviously it says something about me. I should, uh, should look into that. <laughs> Come forth. Hey. I'm not sure how much you can talk about this, but I was just wondering what the creative environment was like to do the song, like how much the back best. and forth there was. The best. Was, uh, writers, I can talk about that. Okay, the writers, I can talk the directors, the yeah. actors, how, much, how long your days were, how much setup there was, because they said there's contraptions you had to put on just yeah. in general. I, I, I'm really happy to talk about that because it was, it was incredible. So they, they had been searching for the father for a long time. Dan Hay had, this, had the idea of the game, he's the creative, director of the Far Cry franchise. He had this game in development for years. They were looking for the father, looking for the father, looking for the father, couldn't find him, couldn't find him, couldn't find him. 
they were getting ready to start shooting in the new year of whatever year we were about to start shooting. I don't know my years so well, but let's just say it was like in November, December, when, when I first, I, I walked in, they'd sent me this monologue, uh, they'd approached me first, I said no, they sent me a monologue, I loved it, I walked into a room, I sat across from the director, a guy named David Footman, awesome guy, I did the monologue once, I get up and I left. He's like, where, where are you going? That was it. They cast me, they flew me to Montreal, I had like, an, they had, I walked into this office in the, the Ubisoft building in Montreal and they had like Montana, like all over the walls and Dan walked me through the world and they had done amazing research on cults. They, um, he, he was so passionate about the project and so specific about what he wanted to create and they were so collaborative. We had like long lunches and a lot of fun just talking, just fleshing it out. They wanted to get to know me as a person. They started writing that way. When we started shooting, we did most of the shooting in Toronto. Um, it was fantastic because, uh, you know, I would go to work. It's a very reasonable shooting day. It's like from nine till five and that's it. Like on a film set, no, on a film set, we're there 16, 17 hours. Sometimes this is be done. So I'd go, I'd work. It was incredibly satisfying work. They were so um, sensitive to the performance process. They were really, it, it was, it, they were very engaged in that. And it was important to them that, that they wanted the performance to be truthful. They had a standard that they wanted to, to meet. So whatever I needed, whatever we had to do to make that work, they did. Even like little things, like you're in a big bomb, for lack of a better word, I don't even know, space. And there's cameras all the way around you, but sometimes it feels very, like as animals, we, if we're in a big space, we're kind of like, you know, you're anxious. It's just, you feel like exposed. So they would create like little almost corners and stuff for me to work in so that it didn't, very much so, they created intimacy. They constantly were looking for ways to create intimacy. When it was, I mean, sometimes you had to be in the big space, like with the, you know, uh, with the throwing the barrel scenes and all that stuff. Um, but the days were, Always, we were always finished by five or six. I was home for dinner. Um, we shot over the course of a year, off and on, back and forth. But I mean, I think maybe over the year, maybe I shot for 20 days. Um, they were great. I've become friends with Dan and Drew in particular. Um, they're wonderful storytellers. I would work with them again in a heartbeat. The best, the best, like such a great experience. You wanna work on more games? Yeah, I would like to. If the character was good, if the writing was good, I, I had a, a very positive experience. It was, um, as an actor, you just want a chance to go into yourself and reveal something. You want to share something of yourself. It could be humor, it could be sadness, it could, whatever it is. You just want to, you want to have that, you want to have that connection with the other actor, and then through that, the audience is going to be invited into the story, and they created an environment to do that. And uh, yeah, it was a blessing, man. Such a blessing. Is it one more thing? Yes. Was there any improv dialogue, or was it? Yeah, yeah, they would let me. I, I'm really lucky as well that people let me. Um, I'm respectful of the writers, so so it's not like I'm just you know. But I I have instincts as well, and I get really into a character, and it kind of like it, the voice becomes my voice. So yeah, they would let me go off, and I would just pull little bits of my life into it just to add. Yeah, so they were super. Um, Super collaborative. I, I can't speak more highly of the whole process. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Hello, hello. Hello again. Uh, I had a had another question, and also I want to say thank you for yesterday. Your work. Um, uh, my question is: is that um, what was your favorite moment playing as the cult leader Joseph C? What was my favorite moment? Yeah. Well. My favorite moment was the hardest moment uh, is the a after, spoiler, uh, my siblings have been taken from me by someone, you. Um, that it was just, you know, because it was, they wrote this, it was a heartbreaking moment and we, we found it, uh, an honesty with it and as an actor, that's all you want. And it was really hard. And um, you know, the nice thing as an actor, I think, and I try to take this lesson back home is that, you know, you play with the idea of losing people that mean a lot to you, but then they're really there still, hopefully. 
and you you realize like how fragile life is and you don't have endless time and you just should love the people closest to you like so ferociously and going through scenes like that where you go into this very dark place in yourself and you even if it's just creatively and you come out you're really there's a, a catharsis and you can love people very purely in your life afterwards so that was a blessing because that was a brutal day uh, but satisfying day and that was that was my favorite moment of the of the, the whole thing yeah thanks you're welcome cool how are you doing hello hi my name is tyler tyler yeah hi tyler you got a jim morrison <laughs> thing you're rocking the crap out of that mic stand right now what you have a jim morrison thing like the way you were swaggering into that you were leaning i thought you were gonna like start singing this is the end or break on through Rock and roll, man. Yeah. Okay, Tyler, what's up? What do I um, I noticed that there was a lot of cultural commentary on the way that Far Cry 5 um, circumvents actual discussion of real world issues, even though... Uh, pick your mouth away from that attempt, because I can't hear you exactly. Uh, like, back, okay. back up for the okay. mic. No, no, okay. keep the mic there, and you be here, and then I'll hear you clearly. Hello? There, perfect. I noticed that there was a lot of cultural commentary yeah. on the way that Far Cry 5 takes upon like, itself like kind of like this phase. It, it takes place in a month in Montana and it has yeah. like, you know, which in real life is a place where a lot of white supremacists are gathering and it seems like it's about to like actually kind of create this deep level of cultural commentary, but I read a lot of commentary about how it sort of circumvents actual engagement with that kind of world where it actually isn't engaging with our reality as much as it is in engaging and kind of like this um kind of like the themes that kind of like this broad strokes representation of these symbols that are kind of removed from the place that they contribute to our reality and i was wondering um how you felt about the narrative and how it's developed whether you think that it was missing that level of engagement and why it would create that kind of like picture, why would it would create that kind of visual identity to relate itself to those things without actually offering a thoughtful narrative examination of the themes that it's attempting to represent. Right, uh, I know that that's been, that was a discussion when the game came out for sure, that people felt that the game's creators had an obligation to make a statement about the world rather than just representing that world, like it, we, we live in such a, we live in a very political world right now. And I think both sides of the political divide want everything to fit into the narrative that's most comfortable for them or that validates their worldview. And it seems like we have diametrically opposing worldviews happening. I don't think that, I, I don't think that the role of an artist is always to satisfy that need. I think that there's a moral ambiguity to, okay, that's 10 or is that, is that two fives to make a 10 or is that just five, okay. Um, I, I know that I know that it disappointed some people and I also feel that in a way by not painting, painting it with, um, the, the, the brush of moral judgment that it made it more dangerous because it was amb ambiguous and the, the player had to decide what it meant to them. And the player has to, is the author of their experience, the way they experience the culture of that world and, and, and of the game. So it's not, there's nothing being laid over top of it. Um, and I, I, I heard the criticisms. For me as an actor, all of that is, is not my concern at, at all. Like I play ostensibly horrible people and I don't feel that any of them are horrible because my job as an actor is to find the commonality in myself and them. And we, we, we are all driven by similar needs. Those needs are expressed in different ways at times. Um, I think the game is, is provocative. It's not, it's not easy. It doesn't fit a narrative. It's unsettling, and I think they did that intentionally, whether the, the 
critics or the audience are satisfied with that they were bold in attempting to put that responsibility the responsibility of judgment onto your experience of the game even if it is provocative do you think that the way is that the approach is provocative and the way that it captures that ambiguity while going through the game is does help one engage with those issues in a way even if it doesn't have a clearly laid out narrative that's right i didn't hear the last little bit do you feel like going through that and exploring that ambiguity has a way in which we are able to engage with it in the real world or do you think that the uh, issues that are present in there are too far removed from our reality to offer a meaningful commentary on how to live our life in the situation we're in in our political situation well i don't think that they're removed at all i mean i i know that um dan and drew went to montana and spent a lot of time with actual cults that that exist there um you know we people are lost in this world and they sometimes you find order in the existing political and religious structures Sometimes you follow a charismatic leader who promises to give you the answers. At the end of the day, both of those paths have their dangers because you're not making the decision. You know, a lot of times it's easier, it's easy to have the answer handed to us, but it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily authentic to you. So I think that it was a very, I mean, realistic. There's a super-powered shovel that can't be that realistic, right? But I think that it's a pretty realistic uh, representation of cults uh, in America. I think that there is a danger to groupthink of any kind. I don't think that they glamorize or, or glorify in any way the Eden's Gate cult, but I think they make them human enough that it becomes real and dangerous, and, and that's what they were trying to do. Thank God I'm speaking for Dan, really. Hi, uh, yeah, again. I yeah. just wanted to ask how you felt about playing Jeremy's dancers. Like, what was your favorite part? I had to ask Jeremy. you. <laughs> I love Jeremy. So Je I did a show called Bitten. It was based on a series of novels. Um, uh, and I play this pack alpha, this father figure. There's obviously another theme emerging of, um, of this family. And that was one of the great experiences of my life. I was just turning uh, 40. When I was cast in that role, I was really having um, a, a moment of challenging myself, like what does it mean to be a man uh, for my family and the community? And the role of Jeremy, a lot of times as an actor you get lucky that you get cast in a role that you don't measure up to yet. And then it's your job to go out and become the person that can fill the broad strokes that the author has laid out for you. And Jeremy was that challenge, and he made me a better man. And I love dearly the cast that I got to spend time with. And uh, it was a, a, a joyous, joyous journey. You're still very close. Um, and it, you know, those moments in life that make you better, how can you not be grateful for those? And that, that made me a better person. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. So are we back to 10 or are we just <laughs> by God? Uh, sorry, sorry. Yes, uh, it's pretty fast, yeah. Uh, who's your favorite member, uh, Faith, Jacob, or John? Oh. Faith. Himself. Faith. Himself. <laughs> Me. Yeah. Jacob. Yeah. John. Right. Faith. Yeah. We'll play musical chairs. <laughs> and when the music stops, it's not there. Um, look, how do you pick your favorite child? You can. You can. You don't tell them. So I'm not going to tell you either. <laughs> it's John. Thank you. Well, first, hello. I'm glad Hi. you're enjoying your plush. Yeah, love it. Oh, um, so one of the residents of Hope County, Kirk Jr., mentioned that he was going to start his own cult. How do you feel about the competition? Um, I'm going to have to streamline my operating procedures. Um, I may have to farm some of my cult stuff offshore to be competitive. I don't know. Uh, actually, no, I'm going to keep it made in America. I'm going to keep my cult made in America. Um, harvest souls, American harvest and souls. Uh, you know, I like the competition, right? I mean, Burger King's never going to be at McDonald's. Or unless they're more successful. No, I'm not really keeping up with it. I, and I have the best list in town. I mean, our bliss is off the chain. It's like Breaking Bad level. I'm like Walter White level bliss. Well, then who would be your Jesse? Is it Faith or is it John? Um, 
I'll think about that. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't think about that. Quick answers. Quick answers. Here we go. Yeah, quick questions, quick answers. What's it like being known for things that everyone wants you dead? I mean, the commander, the father, everyone wants you dead. Heavy is the head that wears. Um, you know, no, I mean, I know, I don't mind actually. It's it's funny. Like people, people hate my characters. I try to be a good man, and I play bad guys. And I think it's important. You need see the thing is, if you don't have a good bad guy, like if you don't really, if the if the person doesn't fill it with their own humanity, then the good guy doesn't have an obstacle to overcome. Uh, and I have a darkness inside of me, clearly. And I'm not being facetious. And I'm blessed that I have an art form that allows you to express that healthily and profitably. And it allows me to be a decent man in real life and a real shitheel on film. <laughs> there you I'm go. I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Amazing. Try a double next time. A quad lutz. Yes, John. Are you coming to apologize for the macaroni? Not in the slightest. Oh. <laughs> if you could add an ending to Far Cry 5, what would it be like? Oh. Can I make their macaroni? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, like Uber Eats wasn't destroyed in the apocalypse, so I could order something to think. Um, I don't, I don't know what, I don't know what the ending should be. I think that that, and this is a cop-out answer, but I think that's the right ending to that game. I think that. It asks questions that we can't glibly or superficially answer and to be left staring into a dark future, the player and, and Joseph, just this is the reality, is honest in a hard way and I like that. So I wouldn't want to see it unless there is this amazing, someone did some fan art of me riding this white horse. Have you seen that? It's unbelievable. Yo, oh my, no, it's, it's like, it's part of a large mural, but like I'm, I'm shirtless riding this white winged stallion through, like that's how I wanted it to end. Like that's like, that's some heroic shit. <laughs> Thank you very much guys for taking the time this afternoon. It was a real pleasure. And uh, have a beautiful weekend. It really is, it's a lovely energy in here, guys. Where's the Green Mountain, West Sacramento? Yeah, how far away is that? I look on Google Maps. Don't, don't tease me like that. No, don't this morning I almost, I shed a single tear because I looked on Uber Eats, it's like there was no In-N-Out burgers to be delivered. Next time I see you at Walmart. So yeah, yeah. what to look for for you. I appreciate that, thank you. That's the ending I want. So far right now, In-N-Out burgers. Thank you guys, take care. Thank you guys. We'll have the exit through.